Hi, I'm Trish. I'm an Australian and I'm living here in the UK. This is my beloved copy of Rilla of Ingleside. You can see the pages are dog-eared and the spine is damaged and it opens directly to my favourite chapter. That's because as a teenager I spent many a night reading this and then falling asleep with it like this on my bed. Not a very nice way to treat a book. Unfortunately, I can't read from it today as this is an abridged version. So I'm putting it aside with love and instead I'm going to read from the screen. Let's hope this works. Rilla of Ingleside, Chapter 15, Until the Daybreak. The Germans have recaptured Primazol, said Susan despairingly, looking up from her newspaper. And now I suppose we'll have to begin calling it by that uncivilised name again. Cousin Sophia was in when the mail came, and when she heard the news, she hove a sigh up from the depths of her stomach, Mrs. Dr. Dear, and said, <gasps> Yes, and they will get Petrograd next, I have no doubt. I said to her, My knowledge of geography is not so profound as I wish it was, but I have an idea that it's quite a walk from Primazol to Petrograd. Cousin Sophia sighed again and said, <sighs> The Grand Duke Nicholas is not the man I took him to be. Do not let him know that, said I. It might hurt his feelings, and he is likely enough to worry him as it is. But you cannot cheer Cousin Sophia up, no matter how sarcastic you are, Mrs. Dr. Dear. She sighed for the third time and groaned out, but the Russians are retreating fast. And I said, well, what of it? They have plenty of room for retreating, have they not? But all the same, Mrs. Dr. Dear, though I would never admit it to Cousin Sophia, I do not like the situation on the Eastern Front. Nobody else liked it either, but all summer the Russian retreat went on, a long, drawn-out agony. I wonder if I shall ever again be able to await the coming of the mail with feelings of composure. Never to speak of pleasure, said Gertrude Oliver. The thought that haunts me night and day is, will the Germans smash Russia completely and then hurl their eastern army, flushed with victory, against the western front? They will not, Miss Oliver, dear, said Susan, assuming the role of prophetess. In the first place, the Almighty will not allow it. In the second, Grand Duke Nicholas, though he may have been a disappointment to us in some respects, knows how to run away decently and in order, and that is very useful knowledge when Germans are chasing you. Norman Douglas declares he is just luring them on and killing ten of them to one he loses, but I am of the opinion he cannot help himself and is just doing the best he can under the circumstances, the same as the rest of us. So do not go so far afield to borrow trouble, Miss Oliver, dear, when there is plenty of it already camping on our very doorstep. Walter had gone to Kingsport the 1st of June. Nan, Di and Faith had gone also to do Red Cross work in their vacation. In mid-July, Walter came home for a week's leave before going overseas. Rilla had lived through the days of his absence on the hope of that week, and now that it had come, she drank every minute of it thirstily, hating even the hours she had to spend in sleep that seemed such a waste of precious moments. In spite of its sadness, it was a beautiful week full of poignant, unforgettable hours when she and Walter had long walks and talks and silences together. He was all her own and she knew he found strength and comfort in her sympathy and understanding. It was very wonderful to know she meant so much to him. The knowledge helped her through the moments that would otherwise have been unendurable and gave her power to smile even to laugh a little bit times. When Walter had gone, she might indulge in the comfort of tears, but not while he was here. She would not even let herself cry at night, lest her eyes should betray her to him in the morning. On his last evening at home, they went together to Rainbow Valley and sat down on the bank of the brook, under the white lady where the gay revels of olden days had been held in the cloudless years. Rainbow Valley was roofed over with a sunset of unusual splendour that night, and a wonderful grey dusk, just touched with starlight, followed it. And then came moonshine, hinting, hiding, revealing, lighting up little dells and hollow hollows here, leaving others in dark velvet shadow. When I am somewhere in France, said Walter, looking around him with eager eyes and all the beauty his soul loved, I shall remember these still, dewy, moon-drenched places, the balsam of the fir trees, the peace of those white pools of moonshine, the strength of the hills, what a beautiful old biblical phrase that is. Rilla, look at those old hills around us, the hills we looked up to as children, wondering what lay for us in the great world beyond them. How calm and strong they are, how patient and changeless, like the heart of a good woman. 
Rilla, my Rilla, do you know what you've been to me this past year? I want to tell you before I go. I could not have lived through it if it had not been for you, little, loving, believing heart. Rilla dared not try to speak. She slipped her hand into Walter's and pressed it hard. I went up over there, Rilla, in that hell upon earth which men who have forgotten God have made. It will be the thought of you that will help me most. I know you'll be as plucky and patient as you've shown yourself to be this past year. I'm not afraid for you. I know that no matter what happens, you'll be Rilla, my Rilla, no matter what happens. Rilla repressed tear and sigh, but could not repress a little shiver, and Walter knew that he had said enough. After a moment of silence, in which each made an unworded promise to the other, he said, No, we won't be sober any more. We'll look beyond the years to the time when the war will be over, and Jem and Jerry and I will come marching home again, and we'll all be happy again. We won't be happy in the same way, said Rilla. No, not in the same way. Nobody who this war has touched will ever be happy again in quite the same way. But it will be a better happiness, I think, little sister. A happiness we've earned. We were happy before the war, weren't we? With a home like Ingleside and a father and mother like ours, we couldn't help being happy. But that happiness was a gift from life and love. It wasn't really ours. Life could take it back at any time. It can never take away the happiness we win for ourselves in the way of duty. I've realised that since I went to Kharki, in spite of my occasional funks when I fall to living over things beforehand. I've been happy since that night in May. Rilla, be awfully good to mother while I'm away. It must be a horrible thing to be a mother in this war. The mothers and sisters and wives and sweethearts have the hardest times. Rilla, you beautiful little thing. Are you anybody's sweetheart? If you are, tell me before I go. No, said Rilla. Then impelled by a wish to be absolutely frank with Walter, in this talk that might be the last they have they would ever have, she added, blushing wildly in the moonlight. But if Kenneth Ford wanted me to be I see, said Walter, and Ken's in Khaki too. Poor little girlie, it's a bit hard for you all round. Well, I'm not leaving any girl to break her heart about me, thank God for that. Rilla glanced up at the manse on the hill, where she could see a light in Una Meredith's window. She felt tempted to say something, then she knew she must not. It was not her secret, and anyway, she did not know, she only suspected. Walter looked around him lingeringly and lovingly. This spot had always been so dear to him. What fun they had had here, Lang Syne. Phantoms of memory seemed to pace the dapple paths and merrily and peep merrily through the swinging boughs. Jem and Jerry, bare-legged, sunburned schoolboys, fishing in the brook and frying trout over the old stone fireplace. Nan and Di in faith in their dimpled, fresh-eyed, childish beauty. You knew the sweet and shy. Carl poring over ants and bugs. Little, slangy, sharp-tanged, good-hearted Mary Vance. The old water that had been himself lying on the grass reading poetry, or wandering through palaces of fancy. They were all here around him. He could see them as plainly as he saw Rilla, as plainly as he had seen the piped piper piping in the valley in the vanished twilight. And they said to him, those gay little ghosts of other days, We were the children of yesterday, Walter. Fight a good fight for the children of today and tomorrow. <laughs> Where are you, Walter? cried Rilla, laughing little. Come back, come back. Walter came back with a long breath. He stood up and looked around him at the beautiful valley of moonlight, as if to impress on his mind and heart every charm it possessed. The dark the great dark plumes of the firs against the silvery sky, the stately white lady, the old magic of the dancing brook, the faithful tree lovers, the beckoning tricksy paths. I shall see it so in my dreams, he said, as he turned away. They went back to Ingleside. Mr. and Mrs. Meredith were there with Gertrude Oliver, who had come from Lowbridge to say goodbye. Everybody was quite cheerful and bright, but nobody said much about the war being over soon as they had when Jem went away. They did not take a book, talk about the war at all, and they thought of nothing else. At last they gathered around the piano and sang the grand old hymn. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. We all come back to God in these days of 
soul-shifting, said Gertrude to John Meredith. There have been days in the past when I didn't believe in God, not as God, only as the impersonal great first cause of the scientists. I believe in him now. I have to. There's nothing else to fall back on but God, humbly, starkly, unconditionally. Our help in ages past, the same yesterday, today and forever, said the minister gently. When we forget God, he remembers us. There was no crowd at the Glen station the next morning to see Walter off. It had become a commonplace for a clad boy to board the early morning train after his last leave. Beside his own, only the manse folk were there and Mary Vance. Mary had sent her miller off the week before with a determined grin, and now considered herself entitled to give expert opinion on such partings, on how such partings should be conducted. The main thing is to smile and act as if nothing was happening, she informed the Ingleside group. The boys all hate the sob act like poison. Miller told me I wasn't to come near the station if I couldn't keep from bawling. So I got through my crying beforehand, and the last I said to him, Good luck, Miller, and if you come back, you'll find I haven't changed any. And if you don't come back, I'll always be proud you went. And in any case, don't fall in love with a French girl. Miller swore he wouldn't, but you can never tell about those fascinating French foreign hussies. Anyway... The last sight he had of me, I was smiling to my limit. Gee, all the rest of the day my face felt as it had been starched and ironed into a smile. In spite of Mary Vance's advice and example, Mrs Blythe, who had sent Jim off with a smile, could not quite manage one for Walter. But at least no one cried. Dog Monday came out of his lair in the shipping shed and sat down close to Walter, thumping his tail vigorously in the boards of the platform whenever Walter spoke to him, and looking up with confident eyes as if to say, I know you'll find Jim and bring him back to me. So long, old fellow, said Carl Meredith cheerfully when the goodbyes had to be said. Tell them we'll be over there and tell them to get their spirits up. I'm coming over presently. Me too, said Shirley laconically, proffering a brown paw. Susan heard him and her face turned very grey. Eunice shook hands quietly, looking at him with wistful, sorrowful, dark blue eyes. But then Eunice's eyes had always been wistful. Walter bent his handsome black head in its khaki cap and kissed her with a warm, comradely kiss of a brother. He had never kissed her before, and for a fleeting moment Eunice's face betrayed her, if anybody had noticed, but nobody did. The conductor shouted, All aboard! Everybody was trying to look cheerful. Walter turned to Rilla. She held his hands and looked up at him. She would not see him again till the daybreak, and, she, and the shadows vanished, and she didn't know if the daybreak would be on this side of the grave or beyond it. Goodbye, she said. On her lips lost all the bitterness it had won through the ages of parting, and bore instead all the sweetness of the old loves of all the women who had ever loved and prayed for the beloved. Write me often and bring Jim's up faithfully according to the Gospel of Morgan, Walter said lightly, having said all the serious things before in Wabba Valley. But at the last moment he took her face between his hands and looked deep into her gallant eyes. God bless you, Rilla, my Rilla, he said softly and tenderly. After all, it was a hard, not a hard thing to fight for a land that poor daughters like this. He stood on the rear platform and waved him as the train pulled out. Rilla was standing by herself, but Una Meredith came to her, and the two girls who loved him most stood together and held each other's cold hands as the tree rounded the curve of the wooded hill. Rilla spent an hour in Rambo Valley that morning, about which she never said a word to anybody. She did not even write in her diary about it. When it was over, she went home and made rumpers for Jim's during the rest of the day. In the evening, she went to a junior Red Cross committee meeting and was severely businesslike. You'd never suppose, said Irene Howard to Oliver Kirk afterwards, that Walter had left for the front only this morning. But some people have no depth of feeling. I suppose it is much the best for them. I often wish I could take things as lightly as Rilla Bythe. End of chapter 15